Um, I appreciate Troy and the library for hosting us. Uh, my name is Kevin Navratel, and I am the Democracy Commitment Coordinator, and I'm a political science professor. And today I'm joined by several of my friends. Uh, on the far left, we have Dr. Laura Lawson Collins, a psychology professor. We have Mary Fafuis uh, Dunkel, who is a sociologist, uh, historian, and political science professor. And then um, to my uh, direct left, we have uh, Professor Dr. Allison Lackney, who teaches sociology. Uh, and so today, our event is on loneliness. And this, um, this uh, entire year, the library has been hosting events um, on loneliness because of our book, Seek You, A Journey Through American Loneliness. And they've had several ex excellent events this semester on loneliness. I urge you to check out the library's YouTube channel um, on some of the past events that they've had. Um, and, and primarily, there's been a lot of events that have looked at um, kind of the problems of loneliness and, and how that hurts individuals and health effects. And uh, there's been an excellent panel that was looking at kind of the global comparisons with loneliness. Um, and all along, I've been thinking that one of the, the problems that we have in democracies is often related to uh, the problem of loneliness. So part of what we're going to be doing today is highlighting how we're becoming more disconnected from each other and, and how we're becoming more lonely, and then the implications that that has for our society. Um, because we are a government of, by, and for the people. If the people are not OK, that's going to have implications for our political system. So again, thank you for being here. We're going to cover uh, lots of territory today, but we wanted to save some time for any questions and comments that you have. Um, so feel free to ask them um, along the way, um, and we'll save some time, uh, uh, hopefully the last 30 minutes or so, for questions and comments as well. All right. So to start off with, we wanted to talk about how uh, social connections have changed. Whenever you yeah. Okay. Um, okay. So uh, basically, in the last um, several decades, our social connections have changed quite a bit. Um, and we started seeing this happen um, towards the end of the 20th century. So into the 1970s, 80s, 90s, we were already starting to talk about how social relationships changed. There was an important book that came out called Bowling Alone. And they just talked about in that book um, all of the many, many different ways that um, we are becoming less and less connected from one another. We're joining fewer groups. Um, we are attending fewer community events. And back in the 80s and the 90s, do you guys have any guess as to what might have been driving some of that? Think about technology. This is kind of pre-internet, right? So technology that might keep people home in the 80s and 90s. Any guesses? Yeah, yeah, TV. Yeah, it was really interesting to read this book here now in 2023 with the perspective that we have today. Um, but kind of the conclusion that Putnam drew at the end of the book was it's TV. You know, TV's destroying our, our community, um, which is kind of interesting if you want to flip the next couple. Um, but this trend has just continued. So you know, we, we really did see it start in, in the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, and it's, it's continued into the 2000s and the 2010s. And of course, with COVID, um, it became a lot worse. And of course, now a lot of the blame is on what? It used to be TVs, now it's on the internet, you know, uh, social media, our phones, right? And there definitely is some evidence there. So if you look at just how people spend their time. During the pandemic, by the way, it peaked um, at nine and a half hours. We're now back down to seven hours <laughs> on screens. Um, but that's a lot of time, you guys. So if th you think about your 24-hour cycle, um, and seven hours are spent in front of screens, that doesn't leave you as much time um, to connect in real life, person to person, face to face. Yeah, and just one thing I wanted to point out, uh, the, the third bullet point here about 12%, um, this is from uh, a recent survey from the Center for American Life, that 12% uh, of Americans had no friends in 2021, and that compares, uh, you know, in 1990 to where only 3% had no friends. 
And uh, the same survey also pointed out that in 1990, a third of respondents had 10 or more friends, whereas in 2021, only 13%. So there's, we could provide you all kinds of data to show this. I think intuitively, you probably know this already, um, but we just are, are much less connected to each other than we historically have been. Is there anybody else want to chime in on this slide? Yeah, I do. I think it's really important that we back up just a little bit. And um, I want to point out what Mr. Nevertil said here, and that we, we are friends. Um, so to just gloss over that it's, kind of ironic that we're sitting here talking about loneliness and that the four of us are are not only work friends but we we do socialize after after the class is let out um, it shouldn't be lost um, I also want to point out that there's a difference between solitude and loneliness mm -hmm. that it's in it, a decent amount of loneliness I think is normal right um, and you can be lonely within a crowd and you can also have a peaceful solitude when you're by yourself. So I think it's really important that we differentiate the concept between peaceful solitude and that feeling of empty loneliness mm -hmm. as we kind of mm -hmm. move forward. Sure. Um, also, I, I feel like we are, um, we're hitting on this concept that loneliness is this brand new idea when even if we go back as far as and, and if you're in my class you know that I based a lot around this and in, you know the industrialization period um, Weber and Marx really felt like the industrial revolution and the industrialization period um, was going to be the downfall of everything um, you know this iron cage of bureaucracy um, or they I in Weber, or I'm sorry, in Marx's alienation, um, you know, it, we, we were, this is, I feel like every generation feels like the next generation is going to be going to hell in a handbasket, mm -hmm. but really what we're doing is we're trying to solve these problems so the next generation can figure it out. Mm -hmm. So, what, only thing I would, I would just add is kind of echoing off of my colleague's point here is that it's ironic that in an age where we have so many ways to connect with one another, we're all still feeling so lonely, right? right. People are, you, you can connect via email, via text, via WhatsApp, via um, Snapchat. Snapchat, via Instagram, whatever it might be, TikTok, I forgot about TikTok. Um, <laughs> but people are still saying how lonely they are. So what does that tell you? Obviously there's some kind of alienation that exists even within these things and there's obviously other factors that, that we're getting to here too. So just would like to point that one out. Um. You know, th this next area of like, why are we becoming more disconnected or, or why are we becoming more lonely? Uh, we could spend days talking mm -hmm. about. Um, it was, I just want to make a quick point with technology. I think it's pretty intuitive with the way that phones looking at screens can make us uh, feel less connected to one another. Um, this is uh, what I meant when I put technology too, is that even the, the, uh, the creators of social media and the, the executives within social media know this. This is uh, from the Facebook whistleblower, Francis Haugen, reported that Facebook had data demonstrating that the people who are most isolated, most isolated are prone to misinformation are widowers, people who move to a new community, and how it, being a widower, moving to a new community, new community uh, eroded your ability to have like a shared reality. So that they, you know, Facebook kind of knew that these individuals would be the most prone to misinformation. So this isn't just why we're more disconnected, but also like how it relates to things going sideways politically, and potentially leading to um, more, more prone to kind of misinformation and conspiracy theories, how we might be more radicalized. And we'll get to this in more detail, but I also want you to just be picking up on those themes as we're talking about these trends that could make us more disconnected, how they also have the connections of, of having kind of political implications. Mm -hmm. Um, I just wanted to jump in with the technology piece as well, um, just to say that um, as we use technology younger and younger, um, our, our brains get wired up differently. Um, so we're, when we're very young, our, our brains are open to, to wiring up on what's around us and to our experience, to our day-to-day -day experience. Um, and when that experience is with an iPad straight in front of us, it can be a lot more difficult to connect to people off screen. 
Um, and so younger kids today, I'm sure that you guys have young cousins and, and neighbors and maybe siblings. Um, we're seeing a lot of difficulty with eye contact. We're seeing a lot of difficulty with um, social anxiety um, and you know depression and, and just generalized anxiety earlier on that I, I do think is connected to um, overwhelming use of technology. And, and you know, you're absolutely right, Allison, that, that every generation, man, since writing, um, you know, we've been saying, this is gonna destroy the youth, you know? <laughs> the youth are, you know, in danger. Um, but, you know, this time we, we definitely are at a place where we're, we're kind of performing an experiment on, on youth right now, and, and we're, we're not really sure how it's gonna turn out. Um, exposing kids to this much screen time this early on um, is going to have an effect. And I, I think one of those effects does tie, unfortunately, to having more difficulty forming connections well, with, with real people. Coupled with COVID, too. We Absolutely. Have, we, we uh, yeah. This. I mean, COVID was terrible timing. We, we haven't seen For this. Sure. Absolutely. Layered. Yeah. Even Socrates said, if you want to go back to ancient Greece, that <laughs> yeah. I know I weep for the next generation. They're so, they're, you know, I'm, I'm basically, they're so dumb. What are we going to do? I'm so, I, I, every generation that, that kind of, there's some certain things that are repeated again and again and again. Now take a different perspective from this, from the text itself. Um, uh, in this, the, the chapter on, it's called, called Click, uh, there's a section entitled, but I don't disagree that we're doing a worse job connecting with one another that we once did. Our tendency is to move away from home, have fewer kids, walk down sidewalks with our heads drooped down our phone over our phones, which a lot of us, I think, do that, risking, you know, running into a pothole or, you know, some other kind of object. But um, there's, um, if you turn to the next page, loneliness is receiving steadily more attention, philosopher Lars Svensson wrote in 2015, but that does not mean there is more of it out there. His perspective is in opposition to the point of view that almost everything that's been written about this for the past 10 years, which is that the spaces between people are widening. So is it that we're just more aware of it, which is, you know, or is it really is it really that much of oh, that that worse? Because I tend to take more of a relative approach, and I've said this to my colleagues too. We were talking about this before. Um, is it really that much of a difference, or are we just more aware of it? But I would agree that there are some things, there are certain variables that exist now that didn't exist before. Um, at the same time, I think that we do have a tendency to idealize things that times that came before us. I hear my own students talk about the past, like is the 80s, which for me is like. That's what I grew up, um, you know, and there wasn't this ideal time. People were worried about things then, about um, um, children being kidnapped. And I mean, there's, there's always been like high anxiety levels about something, and that has to do some, with, with media as well. But that's why I, I tended to be a little bit more hesitant to, to you know, to say that is it, is it as bad? Is it, is it completely, you know, is the, the fire alarm bell is going off and it's the worst time ever? I don't know if it's as bad. Um, I think we, we need a little bit more historical perspective and, and to kind of maybe make that judgment. Um, but definitely there are some variables that are different from before, no doubt, that I will acknowledge. One of the things uh, just in, in passing would like to talk a little bit about how work has changed and maybe how that has, has led us to be perhaps more disconnected, but then also the loss of meaning from work or the type of work and the work-based connections that maybe we historically had, how that might lead people to be more prone to um, extremism and um, radicalization. So, you know, just the decline of unions, you know, we're, we're um, significantly less unionized than we once were. The type of jobs that we have, very, very different. I, as mentioned earlier about COVID, so now working from home, work, working remotely, work, computer work versus being in person type of work. Um, the list goes on and again, as we could do an entire session just on, on work, work alone. Um, and, and you know the gig economy and the types of jobs that we have more service-based uh, jobs that might be less meaningful than ones in the past um, there's there's a, a previous panel um, that was looking at global connections of, of loneliness I think they did an excellent job on this but maybe how in the United States that we promote more individualism um, and, and how we stand out if you look at I don't know if I can There's a, a lot of data showing how we stand out uh, from other countries in terms of how individualized we are. And so this, this uh, data here is from 2015, but it shows that the United States is um, much more likely to say that 
um, and ba basically uh, supporting the idea that like we get ahead by, through our own like hard work that it's we control our destiny. And, you know, many other societies are much more communal, thinking that you know it's partly our success is, is based on what our society produces. Um, so there's that aspect too. I don't want to overemphasize it today, but um, just ideologically, that's that's certainly a factor as well. And our culture um, adores success. So in that vein, um, when someone is lonely there's a there's a stigma that goes along with saying that someone is lonely or claiming that they're lonely um the this next one just like the decline of marriage rates the decline of church attendance decline of traditional work like this is a lot of ways that historically we've gotten our meaning and our connection um the the one that I introduce here with this next bullet point is you can find all kinds of data showing how disconnected we are from our major institutions other than marriage, work, uh, uh, and family. It would be like our governmental organizations. If you look at like approval rate or trust in Congress, approval rate or trust in presidency, the Supreme Court, uh, the media, the list goes on and on. They're at like historic lows. So as citizens, we don't, we don't have a lot of trust or faith in the system as well. Um, so being disconnected from each other, but also kind of being disconnected from society and our governmental institutions at large. Uh, Hannah Art calls this phenomenon atomization. So um, historically, hum human beings are meant to be social animals. And as we start to break down these bonds, it's called animization. So we have communities, and then within these communities, we break down into families. And then the families break down even into smaller units of individuals. So it, the concept that Hannah Arndt proposes to us is this atomization, this breakdown um, that we're seeing of individualism. It would be on the next slide. So, the, yeah. so this, uh, this last point that I'll make that I think is really, uh, could be controversial, but there's um, an organization, the Project on Security and Threats at the University of Chicago, and their director, Robert Papey, um, examined statistics of the people who were involved in the January 6th insurrection. And the biggest factor that they found, the explanatory factor that had the most power, was living in a county that had lost white, non-Hispanic population uh, in the previous 10 years. So when compared to almost 2,900 other counties in the United States, their analysis found that the 250 counties um, of individuals who were charged or re, uh, arrested in the January 6th insurrection found that uh, the counties that had the greatest decline in white, white population had a 13 or 18% chance of sending an insurrectionist to Washington, D.C., where counties that saw the least decline in the white population only had a 3% chance. Uh, so that finding held true even when they controlled for population size, distance to D.C., unemployment rate, urban, rural location. Um, it would occur by chance with less than 1,000% uh, out of 1,000 times. So this one's a little kind of different disconnection, but uh, I'm trying to understand like what, there's probably lots of factors, what would lead somebody to go to the capital insurrection but just this idea that perhaps they're disconnected from society, they feel like their, their world is changing so much. Um, uh, and I think I can just briefly point out that even um, Robert Putnam, who authored Bowling Alone, has done research showing that um, there's so many benefits. We, we all know so many benefits from increased diversity, but there is evidence that increased diversity can cut social capital. And so I think it's consistent with the findings that he found uh, in early 2010 about uh, increasing diversity could cut social capital. Um, this part, I, I, we were talking amongst ourselves that there's a lot that we could cover today. Maybe we can come back to this. Um, I, I have a lot of statistics of just the number of America, uh, millions of Americans who would uh, have indicated through survey research that they would engage in political violence to achieve uh, political ends, uh, that they would engage in violence, uh, including killing people to achieve their political outcomes. So if anybody's interested in that, a uh, whole bunch of data that we could get to on that.
So now the importance of belonging. Okay, so as Allison um, mentioned earlier, we have evolved to be a social species. So when you look at our species, you know, among mammals, um, you know, some animals are more, uh, you know, they, they function well alone. They're meant to be more alone. But we are not one of those species, okay? We are meant to be social. If you think about um, you know, what are our evolutionary advantages? Uh, we don't have sharp claws. We don't have particularly sharp teeth. Um, we've got very soft skin. We survive as a group. We don't survive well as individuals. Um, and the idea here is that uh, we have evolved a number of, of drives um, that push us to be with others, to want to be with others. And those same drives then, the, the alternative is that when we don't feel connected to others, when we feel like we're being rejected, when we feel like we're, we're not accepted, we're not a part of the group, we're not a part of the whole, that, that evolution has given us drives to make us feel really, really crappy so that we are pushed more towards trying to get back together into that group. So we, we have a sense of belonging if you want to um, flip down on the slide here, um, that when we don't have that sense that, that we do belong, it's an emergency signal. It's like thirst. It's not a want. It's a need. It's, it's something deep in our biology that says something that I need to survive is not being met. And this drives a number of physiological processes in the body and in the brain um, that you know, can be kind of surprising. Um, but again, th that this drive is more of a need instead of a want. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you want a No, no, finish your piece. OK, yeah, no, I, I mean, and on the next slide, we'll talk a little bit about the negative health consequences. Um, I think Mary had something to say at the end of the previous one, though. Yeah. Uh, just to kind of piggyback off of that, um, of what Laura was saying and, and what Kevin was saying previously, just to talk a little bit more about, like, what does that mean, the idea of, like, that we're not belonging is, is made to religious organizations or labor unions or things like that. And you, you probably, you hear that and you think, well, what does that really actually mean? So the idea that, you know, in a labor union, if people got together afterwards, they'd go for a drink to the bar afterwards, right? Um, and that was kind of a way for people to come together. Or they would do things. They might be, as a result of the labor union, they were on a sports team together. They, they might play softball together. Or if you belong to a religious organization, you, you went to church or to a mosque or to a, a temple, whatever it might be, um, you might be uh, engaging in things like, you know, in, in charitable works or just getting together for coffee after whatever service you're attending. If indeed all those things are changing and declining and we're not engaging in those things more, what are we doing in that absence? And that means we're probably going home more to ourselves, to our little pods, and you know maybe engage in just being alone more, um, or with our own kind of family circle, whatever that might be. But we're not engaging as much with people outside of that circle. Um, so I just want to kind of point out what, what that actually means in the in you know in the, in the wider. And I can just anecdotally can talk can tell you from my own experience. I see that myself. Just like, and I think it's a, a sort of a product of, of what's been happening in the last you know maybe ten years. Uh, just kind of less engagement. But I had so many years of engagement before that. So what is that going to mean for people coming ahead of us who have not had those years of engagement in those activities? Right. right. And so I, I don't want to spend too much time on this slide um, because this is definitely something that has been covered in, in other talks. But just to say that loneliness is not good for us. It, it's just not. It's not good for our health. It shortens our life expectancy by 15 years. Years. That's a lot. It increases our risk of heart disease. It increases our risk of stroke. It increases our risk of cancer. It gives us worse sleep. This is one of the things that I think is fascinating. So when you sleep at night, a, a part of a function of how well you sleep is how safe you feel. And, and ha, I've, have you guys ever gone somewhere, like maybe a hotel or a friend's house, and you're just waking up every hour, and, and you're just not getting really good sleep? And, and that's normal, and, and that like has... That's a di an adaptive behavior because we're waking up to make sure that we're safe and then, oh, we're safe, we can go back to sleep. Um, that, unfortunately, that process leads us to have a lot of micro awakenings when we sleep, when we're lonely. Okay, so instead of sleeping the full eight hours through, we're waking up 
um, sometimes 20, 30, 40 times at night. Mm -hmm. um, just briefly, it's not enough to be conscious, but it's enough to pull us out of deep sleep so that when we wake up, we feel exhausted. And that exhaustion, again, is another thing that impacts our health. Mm -hmm. It impacts our mental health. It impacts our physical health, um, rates of infection. Again, all sorts of, of physical consequences to this. Um, a, a really well-known uh, social psychologist over at University of Chicago, John Cassiopo, um, documented that feeling lonely is worse for you than smoking regularly. That, it, again, it's, it's, it's bad for us. It's bad for our health. Smoking is communal usually. Yeah. <laughs> right? Smoking is communal. You're usually doing it with somebody else outside talking to them, right? I mean, yeah. Do you want to talk about the... Sure. Why don't you do it? You sure? Yeah. Um, Laura and I were talking about this before, and I think all of us were discussing that there's... So Harvard University started back in the 1930s. It's the, the longest, well, that's, that sounds like uh, redundant, but it's a, a longitudinal study, but it is the longest running longitudinal study, meaning it's a, it's a study running over a long period of time. And sociologists were looking at um, men that were living in Boston um, in different neighborhoods. So some of these guys were like working class guys from like Southie in Boston, and some, and some of these guys were from Harvard. They tracked them over their entire lives. Uh, they come back to them every, I think it was about ten, five to 10 years or so, they come back to them and talk to them, like, what's going on in your life? Kind of talking to their, eventually start talking to their family members too, and seeing what were kind of the factors that made them happy, kind of what made them content, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, one of the comments that's made that's kind of funny is that the guys from, from Harvard never questioned why they, they were being asked, but the guys from Southie kept saying, well, why are, you, why are you coming back to me? Like, my life's not interesting. I've got nothing to say. Um, but ultimately what they discovered was, regardless of what their job was, regardless of what their income was, regardless of what, whatever else they had going on, the people that, that were the most content and happiest with their lives, this is going to sound pretty self-evident, were shockingly what? People who had connections, people who had somebody with relationships, people who maintained societal connections, whether it was friends, whether it was a, real, you know, a, um, a partner, children, those were the things that kept them going the most. Those were the things that kept them active the most. It wasn't pe and people, as, as uh, Laura already mentioned, if you are not engaging in those things, you're likelier to die earlier, unfortunately. Um, so the study is still going, and I think now they're, they're interviewing more of the wives and the, you know, and the, because they left them out for a long time, the children of those, of those yeah. people who have now passed away, and it's just kind of a fascinating thing, but it is the, I think it is the longest study that has, that's ever, ever continuously run. So if you want to, there's a TED, there's a couple TED Talks on it, um, I think there's at least a couple podcasts out there if you're ever interested in looking them up. So if you just, I think Google Harvard. Harvard, 75 year study. It's hard, yes, it's easier than longitudinal, so yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, you know, as we were talking about physical effects are also cognitive effects. So cognitive would be what's going on inside your mind, your thought processes. Um, and unfortunately, being lonely can snowball into um, being less social, even though that's what you want. That's what your body's driving you towards is to be more social. But unfortunately, when we're lonely, um, we become more hypervigilant because we are in more danger. You know, again, just in terms of evolution, we're in more danger if we're alone. So we are more, you know, we're, we're more vigilant for threats that might be coming up. So that means that we are thinking with these structures in the middle of our brain called our amygdala. The amygdala are what turn on when we're, when we're threatened. When we feel like someone or something is threatening us, our amygdala turn on. And when those turn on, they send signals to the frontal lobe, to the prefrontal cortex right here, which is what allows you to process more slowly and more rationally, think about pros and cons and consequences, and it shuts that prefrontal cortex down. Not totally, but it, it kind of limits it so that you're constantly searching for threat. And, and what they find is that people who are lonely are able to assess threat and find threat more quickly than people who are not lonely. Well, the problem is, is that if you're constantly looking for threat, you're seeing it in everyday behavior. Mm -hmm. So as I'm looking out at all of you, you know, none of you are smiling, which is totally fine and normal. You <laughs> don't need to be smiling. But if I feel really lonely and I feel like I'm under threat and I'm looking out at neutral faces, how might I interpret those neutral faces? Threatening. 
uh, are they angry at me? Are they upset at me? What's going on? You know, and so that, that starts to instill fear or anger, right? Fight or flight. And I'm going to be less personable if I constantly feel like I'm under threat, like I'm under attack. I'm, I'm going to have a harder time forming social connections. I'm going to assume people are angry at me. I'm going to be more defensive. I'm going to be more likely to take offense at something someone says. Someone gives me a look. And I think, oh, they don't like me, so now I might behave in a more unlikable way. Um, so again, you know, you feel like you're lonely, you become a bit more like a porcupine, you know, and you become more defensive, kind of more difficult to be around. Um, and so it, it makes it harder to form relationships when we're in this state, ironically, you know, this state that kind of, you know, primes us uh, when we're feeling lonely unfortunately can push other people away and make us more lonely. Um, and oftentimes what ends up happening, you feel lonely with the people around you, the physical people around you, what do you end up turning to? What do you guys think? If you feel like the people around you, immediately around you are judging you and they're not nice, where are you gonna turn? Social media, right? You know, people that you can maybe try to connect with on social media, or even people that you don't know on social media, but people you might feel more connected to, and you try to use social media to fill the gap, but it's not the same. It's just not the same as having real life mm -hmm. friends. Mm -hmm. um, so if you go on to the next slide, there's a visualization of this. And if you look right at the top where it says motivation to connect, so we have this motivation to connect, but unfortunately it's combined with this hypervigilance for social threats. We constantly feel like we're under threat. We then pay attention to the things that are threatening around us that we feel like are threatening. We interpret things as threatening. We then behave in a way that you know shows us that shows other people that we feel threatened, that we feel like they're they're judging us and we're harder to be around, which then creates more social isolation. And it's just unfortunately a, a cycle effect that can be difficult to pull out of when you don't realize you know, the mechanism of what's going on. So could that be a reason why maybe people are shooting people on their driveways who are walking up just to... Uh, yeah. 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 That would be an extreme response. Um, response. So I think this one is... I've got Mary down for that. this one. I know. I don't, I don't see... Uh, Where, um, yeah. This one. Yeah. Why? Why did we have... I think we this is yours. talked about this before. Um, yeah. That's fine. Um, if you have anything to say, otherwise I'll just skip through. Uh, so, I, I mean, for this one, basically just what we're saying is that when people get more lonely, they feel more threatened, this can go into anxiety and anger yeah. as well, yeah. okay? So when you feel like you're constantly under threat, you feel like other people are judging you, you feel like you don't belong, that can result in more anger. Mm -hmm. And when we have more anger, it makes us feel like, you know, other people are working against us, things aren't fair, things aren't right. And it can make us um, more likely to join groups that are kind of anti-mainstream, that have anger towards the mainstream, um, because we're not getting what we're due. I was even going to add, sorry, I, I did have something, and I, okay. I, I apologize. I, was, some, I think a lot of the, the videos that you're seeing on, seeing on YouTube, <laughs> right, like the guy screaming about the baby on Southwest Airlines, and, and behavior that just seems to be kind of, kind of beyond what sort of how normal human beings might act in a situation. Um, and that seems to also obviously get more clicks, so I think that also kind of emboldens people as well. But I think that that's also kind of making people, the, the more stressed they're feeling in situations, the less they're able to deal with it, and then the more they're kind of imploding. And now all that's being being filmed and being put on for all of us to enjoy and then therefore to comment on and click on and like on and talk about and and, and kind, of, kind of continue that cycle more and more. Right. And, and we assume then that it's more normal as yeah. well. It yeah. becomes normalized. Yeah. 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 So the, the next part of this is connecting all of this uh, data that we have on loneliness and disconnection and, the, and the, the negatives that it has to the politics part. So how could this possibly lead us to a situation where we have more polarization mm -hmm and extremism. So one of the things that happens in political science, one of the things that is pretty well known is how Democrats and Republicans, liberals and conservatives are becoming further apart from one another. So we call this polarization, that you know they're, they're going to the kind of ends of the spectrum. Liberals are becoming more liberal, conservatives are becoming more conservative. 
and how, how could something like this happen based on what we've covered so far. So Putnam, the idea of bowling alone, that we, instead of, and this was written again in the late 19, this is 1990s. 1990s, yeah. Yeah, uh, that instead of joining a bowling league that we're going bowling alone, um, and how the, the, the benefits, I think Mary talked about this earlier, is that when we're in a bowling league, I might meet people from different backgrounds different neighborhoods, uh, different religions, different race, ethnic groups, the list goes on and on. So part of this is just called the, there's bridging. We're bridging the divide between different groups. And so if we're not in groups, we're losing that potential to bridge. And I think uh, clearly in social media, we can be in groups. I can, I can um, be in Facebook groups. I can you know, like things on social media, but then the algorithms are going to kind of t be tailor-made for me and my political beliefs that I have where I'm gonna become less exposed to potentially content and people of different backgrounds. So that's one, I think, aspect of what we've talked about so far that could help us understand. The other thing is that as an individual, I'm just one person. You know, I contact my elected official, you know, it, it's not that it doesn't mean anything, but I'm just one person. But when I'm joining, when I'm in an interest group or some other sort of civic group, um, it multiplies my power. And so as citizens, we're losing our power politically when we are not in groups. And then when we have declining social capital, there's a huge uh, connection to like negatives in our neighborhoods and our society. Do you want to jump on that? Um, okay, so I, I think it's really important to address these declining social capitals as it's related to social problems. Um, this cost of loneliness, um, if you're speaking of economic terms, um, really can't be ignored. Research tells us that lonely people are more, more visit the doctor more often than non-lonely people, and their hospital admission rate is nearly double. Um, so there's definitely something <coughs> going on behind the metaphorical curtain here. Um, it also results in lower academic performance. So, you know, this is directly influences our demographic here at Moraine. Um, researchers say that this is correlates with procrastination. So it, it state, states that if you're feeling lonely, you're more likely to procrastinate, which is going to then directly respond or lower academic performance. Um, it also is correlates with um, socioeconomic standing. If you live in a poorer area, you live in fear and isolation, and you're less likely to go outside. If you're less likely to go outside and you feel homebound, you're less likely to make connections with your neighbors. Um, and that cycle just keeps building and building and building. Um, so this loneliness is not even equitably distributed throughout society. We're seeing it um, compound in the, in the lower income classes. Um, some of the consequences of this are then related to employment, education, healthcare, um, and even public transportation. I was gonna, if I may chime in, uh, just kind of from a historical perspective. Um, so if you were to go back and look at, let's say, World War I and World War II propaganda posters, this is kind of going back to Kevin's point about bridging across groups. Uh, a lot of the verbiage, a lot of the language, and there's about like we as groups, and um, a lot of my students have heard me. I talked about my, my aunt. I had an aunt who lived to be 103. She just passed away last year. Um, oh, she was wonderful. She survived the Great Depression, World War, you know, World War II, and everything that came after. But it was there was always this talk about like you know th doing things for the country and doing things as a group together and things that they kind of survived collectively. And I think that one of the things that has happened across the years is that that we are kind of there are these op less opportunities to kind of bring us together. So. I'm sure most of the young men in this room would not you know, be like super thrilled about having a draft, right? But one of the things that the draft did in this country, um, military draft did, was to bring across you know, people from different societies, right? So it might be, you're from Brooklyn, and you know, you're from Mississippi, and you're from California, but we all come together and we're all in the same unit, and we know we're all kind of hanging out together and being trained together and forged by these common bonds, and you become friends, and those friendships can exist for a lifetime, right? 
um, and then kind of it, that's continues to snowball over the years. We sort of lost um, a lot of those 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 bridges that have existed because we don't have a lot of these same attempts to come together. We may have events here and there that are isolated, uh, where we have these moments of kind of national unity, but these these kind of these, these threads that sort of held us together, um, or even like you know in, in back in during the Great Depression when there was less media, right? So there was the radio. Um, and, and President Franklin Roosevelt would come onto the radio to speak to people. People would literally look at it as the president's coming on to talk to me. The president, my president is coming to talk to me. I need to be at home to listen to what he has to say. And so people would come sit down and listen. And it was like a family. Everyone listened to it together. And kind of people were on the same page. I'd even extend that as the, the bridging. And this may be seem like a little bit of a stretch, but I think there's some validity to it. If you look at even the TV, like the four of us grew up at a time when we had like three channels. Right, we had like ABC, NBC, CBS, thing like channel. We had like 32 that came out like a little bit later on. That was like Fox, right? But that was it. Or Channel 11, you know, PBS. Um, but that was about it. So we all watched the same things. When I asked my sociology students a while ago, I said, "Ask your parents um, if any of them knows who shot Jr." <laughs> and that refers to a show called Dallas that was on for years with soap opera. I said, "Ask anybody if they know if they know what that means." Um, one kid's mom was born like in 1984, so she had no clue, but um, a lot of them said, oh yeah, yeah, I right away, they knew, because it was like well, this national thing. This was a TV show where the main character got shot, and it was like, their numbers were like, it was like 80 million people watched the finale of that. So there were these opportunities. Now if you get the Super Bowl, right, that people watch, I think it's like 30 million people that watch that, and that considered to be, those are considered to be great numbers. Right, so there's a lot less things that are kind of bridges that bring us together, collective things that when you go to work the next day, you could talk about it with people, say, hey, did you watch that thing that was on TV last night? There are fewer of these opportunities that exist that are these kind of communal things that bring us together. Um, and I think there's still some things that, that, that do that, but um, I think maybe for you guys might be things on TikTok that you watch that you're all kind of aware of that old people like me who don't, are not on TikTok, I don't know. Um, but I think there's just less that, that kind of all of us as a collective know about. I, well, it, it, as you bring that up, I think one of the interesting things that um, after 9-11, our president encouraged us to go shopping. Yeah, yeah. Which... That was the way to come together. That was, yeah, that was... <laughs> yeah. Not can save gas, not, not <laughs> rubber, not this. <clears throat> it was like, no, just, uh, yeah. Go shopping. Shop. Yeah. 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 That'll show on. Yeah, there are a lot less opportunities. <laughs> Whereas when you tell people, you know, grow a garden, because the, the food, thank you for saying that, because the wheat needs to go to the troops, right? And so that's why we started using a corn. Garden, and right, a victory right, garden. That's right. why we all have addictions to corn and corn syrup, because we started using corn when all the wheat was going to the troops. But that's another story. Um, but, you know, things, again, the opportunities where I think Americans are willing to do things and they are, are willing to sacrifice if they are asked and they're brought into it. But, yeah. You know, shopping. I don't need any help to be encouraged to shop. I can do that very easily. But um, that yeah. is true. Yes, <laughs> yeah. I'm very good at it too. By the way, yeah. So we're just down to a couple points here, and then we'll turn it over to you with any questions or comments that you have. Um, but but now how we how we get to the radicalization, and and this is just going to cite a couple studies. So a 2020 study published in Journal of Group Processing and Intergroup Relations found that social exclusion is the leading factor behind radicalization. And then we have a 2021 study um, by researchers from the RAND Corporation that found that loneliness is the predominant reason people adopt extremist views and join extremist groups. And then this is really similar to what um, Laura had mentioned earlier um, about that we're gonna be more um, threat, um, attuned to threats. Um, this is from a book called Lost Connections by jo uh, Johan Harari. Um, this is on page 99, this is a direct quote. Put lonely people into brain scanning machines and he noticed that they would spot potential threats um, 150 milliseconds while it took socially connected people twice as long at 300 milliseconds to notice the same threat. So disconnection can lead us into more disconnection. And then the last slide that we have is on how loneliness and disconnection may be uh, kind of the uh, in key ingredients for the rise of authoritarianism. Oh, I'm happy to take this. Yeah. Um, so Arndt, <laughs> I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of Hannah Arndt. She's, she's a heavy read. Um, so I'll, I'll give you the, the super cliff notes here. Um, what, what, what Hannah Arndt says is that it's really easy to, um, to take a mob 
and get them angry. Because what they have in common is anger. And that they're discontent with their current state. Um, and this is kind of what we saw with January 6th. Really the only thing that people had in common were that they were angry. She calls this negative solidarity, right? Because so when people are happy, it's really hard to like, you know, rally the troops. <laughs> but when people are angry, you can be like, you're angry, you're angry, you're angry. Um, one of the things that stuck out particularly for, well, a lot of things stuck out with January 6th, um, but one of the things, if you noticed, Trump kept talking about we, 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 but it wasn't we, it was, no. um, yeah, like it wasn't, he was nowhere to be found. So it was like, y'all, and not him. Yeah. Yeah. He, yeah, he had, he wasn't risking anything. Um, Arndt also is, oh my goodness, when I don't even, this was, her experience is drawn from her um, escape from, from Nazis. But what she has in common with the current experience is that there's, on a, she, unemployment, um, inflation. And those are aspects that make people fearful and can make people angry. Um, so, but Arndt believed that totalitarianism, and this is kind of connected to the whole January 6th um, debacle, is that people have to lose their relationships with themselves. And this is where the loneliness comes from. They have to stop thinking for themselves. We get this with social media, right? You stop thinking as an activity, and you let other people think for you, right? Like the likes. You're not really thinking. I've seen, I've seen people do this. They scroll right through, double, you know, what you, you double click, and it like gives you a heart. Scroll, <laughs> double click, scroll, double click, scroll, double click. You're not really thinking about what you're thinking about. And Arndt says you have to think as an activity, as an activity, and that's a good thing. Um, so when people stop relying on their own judgment, they're allowing somebody else to come in and think for them. Um, and that's aren't in a little bitty nutshell. <laughs> I just add that, yeah, she, to her point, it's 75 years ago, that 1951, yeah. I think is when this book was published. Uh, but it seems, as she pointed, it's a heavy read, but it's a very timely read. If you're, very, if you're interested in kind of understanding the way that, that you can rile up people um, and that it's easiest to do this when they're isolated and uh, disconnected from one another. Mm -hmm. So we're just a couple minutes behind schedule, so we'll stop at this point. Um, we could talk about what government or what, po what we might be able to do to, to fix some of these things, but at this point we thought we'd turn it over to you to see what kind of questions, comments, uh, thoughts, or reactions that you, you might have based on what you've heard so far. So. Troy, do you have a microphone that you could bring around? Yes. Um, so I had a question with, um, in the US, we particularly have a layout of our community, specifically um, in suburbs that we're very far away mm. from like stores and things like that. <sighs> and like going to a grocery store is such a common way to connect us because we all need food. But in the suburbs here specifically, you're so far away from it, you have to drive there. Mm -hmm. There's way more ways to be isolated during a grocery shopping experience mm -hmm. or any shopping experience. So do you, and that's kind of different from like a lot of countries where like specifically in like England or like um, Tokyo or in like South Korea, you can just go downstairs from your apartment and go grocery shopping. You know your neighbors, you know everyone around you because you see them every day. Do you think that's like a huge issue in the U.S. with like lacking our connection? Are you taking this one? You mind if I start? You, you, you can take, you, you start, you start, you start. Okay. You start. Uh, absolutely, we actually, thank you so much for saying that because that's one of the points I had not made I was gonna get to and the, the, the text talks about this, the idea of, the sprawl of the suburbs post-World War II that started in the, the 20s, but it got even bigger after the, right? Everyone wanted their, their house, right? The white picket fence and the dog and the two and a half kids. And you know, the book actually has a picture of that. Um, and they do everyone having their cul-de-sac, everyone building up their house and having their closing their door, having their fence 
Um, yeah, absolutely. You know, if you talk to like, this is an anecdotally here, if you talk to people that kind of grew up even even if they didn't grow up in the city, but if they grew up like in kind of the areas that were considered sub suburby, like in the 60s even or 70s, the houses were much closer together. Uh, you didn't have much privacy. Everyone kind of knew, you know, you were all kind of sitting on your stoops talking to one another. People kind of knew one another, but now it's much more spread out. Um, most of the, in most of the cases, to your point, in many of the suburbs, like if you look around even, you know, there's sidewalks in some of the neighborhoods, but they're not really conducive to walking. The idea is that you're going to be forced to drive because the thinking was that oh, we, we've rendered walking like you, it's useless. We don't need to walk anymore. We have these cars. That's why we. I mean, we don't need to. We've got the highways to get us, you know, out of the out of the, the city in case there's ever um, a nuclear event that we need to escape from the city fast, right? But those these cars are going to enable us to get anywhere we need to go, so we don't even need sidewalks anymore. So unless you're living in certain suburban communities like. Um, and some of the like Lagrange that comes to mind, or, or Hinsdale, or Elmhurst, that have kind of cute little downtown areas where you can kind of go and shop and walk. If you're living around here, like I grew up here in Palos Hills myself, and it's it's hard to walk at places. It's hard to walk in. In I live in Tinley now. You you really can't walk anywhere. You could maybe do a couple little things here and there, but it's not conducive to walk. And so if you're not outside as much, you're not seeing your neighbors as much. I met so many more neighbors when I got a dog. Because everyone's outside, you're talking. Otherwise, we're we're going into it. We're getting out of our car. People drive into their their garage, close their garage, and you don't see them or talk to them. So, 100%, I think that you're absolutely right. This the cul-de-sac effect, right? The idea that we're living in these little areas that have isolated us from other people, and we're not engaging. I would add to that. There's one thing that's not. That I would say that's, that's kind of a good thing to a degree. Is that I think in the past, I think that people neighbors, like if you watch like old movies from the 50s, they'll show people like. You know, people are always kind of neighbors were always getting together and, and like having like dinner parties and Bring things like casserole. that. Bring a, ca a casserole over, and um, you know that's kind of shifted too. And I think part of it's because parents and I'm sure Laura could talk to this more than we would, but parents are so much more involved in their kids' lives than they were before. It's kind of considered more acceptable now for kids to parents to spend less time with their kind of outside social circle and more time with their children and being at their kids' games and things like that. But to what, to what expense, though? What is, being, what is being lost as a result of that? So absolutely, uh, I would say that you're nailed it with that point, yeah. Yep. And I would say I grew up with that experience. I, grew, I, I was a city kid um, and grew up, I, I knew the bus schedule. Um, I could, you know, I, I, we could take the bus downtown to the beaches, wherever we wanted to go then moved to the suburbs, and boy, was it a culture shock. <laughs> Holy cow. Um, people literally would drive into their garages, and you wouldn't see anybody. Um, yeah. it, it, it was really different. I think um, we're also we're lose, losing a lot of our green spaces, um, and by that, what I mean are like dog parks, um, parks just for themselves, and that brings a lot of people together, as well as just healthy for your mm -hmm. for your mental space. Mm -hmm. um, it is it is it is real. <laughs> um, I've also noticed a big shift on our campus. Um, I I would say ten years ago, students would hang out a lot more mm -hmm. outside. H hacky, I haven't seen it. A student play hacky sack <laughs> in years. I don't. Is that even still a thing? Um, but hacky sack, yeah. frisbee. Yeah, frisbee. Even like sitting around playing guitar. I haven't seen that in a long time. I don't know if it's just not like cool. Pandemic. Or yeah. Like, yeah. Or if y'all are just super busy. And this is a commuter campus, so think the dynamic is different on a commuter campus. But still, you're right. To your point, it was more mm -hmm. that did exist more before. I just wanted to add that it was an excellent uh, observation, Caitlin. And you know, one of the uh, things that governments could do, uh, if you notice on the slide that we had it prepared, is to 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 get in the zoning and, and how we create more public spaces. Uh, and I think the previous panel um, did a really good job. Um, it was about a month ago um, in, in looking at um, various countries, and and there was an example of kind of Denmark with one of the panelists, Annie Rasmussen talking about her native uh, uh, country of, of Denmark. And, um, you know, if you, you go, sometimes when you go abroad, you notice that it's a lot easier to just stroll and hang out in public spaces, public steps, mm -hmm. and it's act like they've constructed buildings to, to, to foster that interaction. Whereas, you know, if you especially go down to the loop now, like loitering and hanging out in groups is, is not only 
um, it's actively discouraged, right, or policed against. And so um, how we create our public spaces and allow uh, groups to actually form outside. Uh, you know, the idea that maybe if you look at some of the older homes, you notice that they have a bigger front porch. People hung out on their front porch and people would walk by. Um, and, and you, you know, now do we have sidewalks? Do we have the front porches? Instead, we have the bigger backyards and the big fences where we're kind of doing our own thing in the backyards. Um, and the, the idea of going shopping, like you might meet people at the store, like you can pay people to have your groceries delivered. You know, there's just the, the, the higher income people are able to just opt out of being around other people in a lot of different ways. And so we're not getting bridging in, in part because people are just uh, paying their way out of having to do things where they, they might be forced to be around people, especially of different groups. And in suburbs, um, property taxes are higher when you have paved sidewalks. Mm -hmm. yeah. So if uh, a municipality would like to come in and put in sidewalks, the residents will petition to not have sidewalks mm -hmm. put in purposefully to save them money. So when it comes to loneliness too, and what you guys were saying, I also think that work does play a big role with the family. When every person is working, especially the children, there's no time to see either your parents or your sibling, or you have a younger sibling who's at school. You don't even get to see each other. And the same thing is with your friends outside of work. Like, yeah, you see your work buddies, but it's completely different than seeing like your family, your friends, or like even just coming to school, it just feels so different. It, mm -hmm. it doesn't feel like you're, you're happy with what's going on at work and stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was kind of the theme I was hitting at when we put work up there, but then I think you also raise another point about how um, to, there's more dual income uh, mm -hmm. families to where to, to be able to exist in this um, current <laughs> economy, it, it requires two incomes in the household. And sometimes a lot of these modern jobs are nights and weekends. And you know, so we're working a lot. We have two people working in the household. Um, we're busy. And, and it may be in part of that, we're not able to spend as much time with, with neighbors and friends. Uh, the schedules are just hectic. Um, but I, I, you know, there's, I think, a lot to that comment about the types of jobs we have and the, the lack of connections we're getting at work, the lack of meaningful work, the lack of having a good enough paying job to where we don't have to work as much, um, all of this factors in. So it's, it's a great observation as well. I'll take this too. Um, it, it, when it comes down to work, research has also shown that there's gender differences. Um, men typically foster their relationships through gender. Uh, you know, relationships are, are definitely important for both genders. Um, but men have, are forged their relationships through work. Um, in Cornell, researchers um, did a study in which they um, interviewed firehouses, um, three fire stations, which planned, cooked, and ate their meals together. And they found those that did were two times likely to perform were, perform two times better than those that did not. Now think about, these are our first responders. So if you're performing in life or death <coughs> situations, you probably want to perform two times better. Mm -hmm. um, they also did uh, personal interviews with these firefighters, and they found that if a firefighter did not it, it, cook or eat with their group, um, it was a sign of disrespect. Um, so again, I think that there's you know some underlying uh, cultural significance to bonding at work. What well, one more piece to that? Uh, I think it's Finland or Denmark. Could be both. But the communal housing to where you know we may um, save up and, and or work extra hours so we can have this nice house in the suburbs. Whereas other societies have organized things differently. And you know, one of the stresses that, that I have on a week to week, day to day basis is just like, who's making dinner? How do we get all this done? And so some, uh, like in Denmark and Finland, there's examples of communal housing to where 
Um, you know, you have your own private bedroom, but um, there's multiple families in the same household. And then, you know, my colleagues could probably speak to this better than me, but historically we had more um, intergenerational living. Mm -hmm. You know, so if you're, if you're just, if every family is just making dinner on their own, it is tough. But if you instead have a communal agreement to where one family is making dinner uh, one night a week, it's a lot easier to just do that for one, for one family. Mm -hmm. So I think we're just doing so much individually, um, back to individualism, that it's, it's making things harder. Oh, sorry, didn't see it coming. So uh, throughout this entire presentation, I've kind of noticed a trend where we started off with talking about technology and how it could be affecting and probably limiting our social lives. But the more we talk about it, it the more it sounds like it's more of a cultural problem than it is a technological problem. Because while there are cons to technology, there are pros. Like if I wanted to make a friend all the way in Germany, for example, mm -hmm. I could just do mm -hmm. that with a simple text. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, my question is, is technology really the issue here? Because it seems more like an American cultural issue mm -hmm. than a technological issue. Mm -hmm. That's a really good point. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I'll just start. I, I think that the answer is it's both. It's both. Um, so I think that there definitely are cultural differences about the United States that make us more prone to isolation and loneliness. But uh, loneliness is not only here in the United States. We do see it in other countries. And I, I think that there are some pretty compelling studies out there to connect um, the use of technology to loneliness. Now, it doesn't you know, it doesn't happen that way for every single person. And for some people, um, they are able to use technology to connect to more people in a, in a very meaningful way. Um, but one of the things with technology um, is that there is less bridging. So technology allows us to exist within a, a bubble, you know, where we talk to people who have similar interests, we talk to people who have similar, similar beliefs, and that does tend to make us more polarized from people who we see as not like us, as different as, as them. Um, so although we might be able to, I was actually thinking of this earlier, you know, we might be able to, uh, just like with the draft, meet someone from Mississippi and someone from Arkansas and someone from California, you know, through technology, we're able to make those connections. But the difference is, is that it usually revolves around um, a shared belief system or a shared idea, a shared interest. Um, and it's different from putting people from all different kinds of walks of life and all different interests and all different political persuasions and experiences together all into one. Um, so again, you know, I, I, I definitely agree with your point that technology can bring people together and it can be used as a tool to bring people together. Um, but there is some pretty compelling research to say that, on average, how it's used um, for most people, the more they use it, the more lonely they feel. Mm -hmm. So again, not everybody, but for most people, loneliness goes up with technology use, mm -hmm. screen time. Um, not to say that there aren't other contributors, there definitely are. And I would definitely agree that I think that technology has been sometimes demonized, like every generation we're afraid. Right. Well, if we start using a dishwasher, then we're gonna forget how to wash our own <laughs> plates. And if we start using a washing machine, we're gonna forget how to wash our clothes. We've always done that, that's, that's relative for sure. But I think Laura's point is also a good one. There's a section in the text that talks about robots being used in nursing homes for the elderly to provide companionship. And it kind of like goes back and forth talking about the idea, well, is it, you know, is it really a good substitute for people whose baby kids are too busy to come see them or won't make the time to come see them? Or on the other hand, is it a bad thing? Is it, is it, what's wrong with it if it, you know, if this machine, this thing is giving it somebody companionship and making them feel less lonely? Why is that a bad thing necessarily? So it's kind of an interesting, um, especially because for the elderly, that's a, a very, very real, um, real thing. So I, I will say uh, what you just said reminded me of a stat that I just heard the other day um, that 
when you look at loneliness, traditionally the population that has been the loneliness, the loneliest in the United States has been the elderly. Mm -hmm. um, today, that has shifted to people in their 20s. Yeah. So today, people in their 20s, on average, not everybody, but on average, are lonelier than people in their 70s and 80s, um, which I think t tells you something. Again, you know, there are definitely are other contributors, but I, I think that we could make an argument that technology, um, how it's used, uh, dominantly can can make us more lonely, mm -hmm. is making us more lonely. I know we have another question, but I just want to say to that comment, it's a good one, Jacob, and, and we've talked about this in class, but the screens are not the same as a face in terms of how the, the positive feelings we get from eye contact and being in person. Uh, the second thing I would say back to Putnam with uh, bridging and bonding, you know, somebody from my, um, it turns out like because my wife's involved in the PTA, she met somebody who my, my, my daughter had to have this like kind of urgent um, surgery and because she knew somebody through the PTA group, uh, we were able to get like a, a hand surgeon um, like the next day. And so the idea that Putnam was talking about is like somebody in your bowling league might, uh, you know, you have a leak in your roof and you got a roofer in your bowling league and they can help you out. Like somebody in Germany or whatever example you came up with, they might be able to give you like a Yelp review or you're like direct you to a website, but like they may not, you don't have that same personal connection. So the key is with these things, can you count on people in moments of need, of, of crises or need? And I think it's the face-to-face -face friends, the ones that are actually in your, 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 your networks that are able to actually help you out. Sorry, go ahead with the, the question. Yeah, Thank hi, you. Um, just, uh, uh, my name is Juan Carvajal. I'm a student here. I also work for the student newspaper, The Glacier. Uh, so I had a few questions that may, may, uh, may not be included for a piece, if that's okay with you guys. Just wanted to keep that clear. Um, do I have a limit on how many questions I can add? I have like a, I we, have like, uh, we have six minutes. Okay, I've got like a but few. But we've got time afterwards for the paper. You can okay. register for all of our classes. Okay. That's true. Um, I actually, I've, take, I've taken Dr. Lalland's classes before um, for social psychology. Um, one of the first things I wanted to think about, um, I guess I want to direct this first to Navratil, but I think any, all of you can kind of answer this. If you're, I don't know how you aware you guys are of the, it's called the hikomori in Japan. It's a term used for people who socially alienate themselves. Yeah, 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 and yeah. And it's very common, especially among men. And it's um, it's more common among people in their 20s, but also 30s, 40s, all ages. But it's and it's also women as well. It's been growing there, and now it's been growing in South Korea. It's been growing in Singapore. Um, an interesting parallel is that all those countries are very efficient. They they uh, their cultures. Uh, prioritize work and work ethic and just being being able to give put in your best work to a community here we prioritize um, giving our best work more as an individual to build yourself up mm -hmm. so seeing those parallels with um you know like the work ethic and being efficient capitalist economies um, as well as the cultures do you see like parallels in the effects of what American loneliness is creating like do you, do you see parallels in that? And do you think that, I don't want to come off very like. No, I, okay, uh, I'll. No. Okay. Yeah. Well, I think what, what you're speaking of is that kind of loneliness is coupled with solitude, mm -hmm. right? Because they isolate yeah. themselves very often in a room by themselves, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, when we, when we started the panel, you can be lonely in a room full yeah. of people, mm -hmm. that type of. Lonely, that kind of type of loneliness that you're speaking of is a, a solitude coupled with mm -hmm. loneliness. So if you're drawing like that Venn diagram, loneliness, solitude, boom, they're right in the middle. Um, I don't know how that would take off here. Mm -hmm. I don't know how that would take off in the yeah. United States. I just, I just don't. Know. I just wanted to know like if you, any of your guys' views on it. If you see like, I don't mean to come off alarmist <laughs> on anything. I just want to know like, do you think that things like that could start happening. I feel like they already kind of are, to be honest. And I, is it, I don't know if it's as much of a response, mm -hmm. and I don't know enough about it to say this, but is it, is, cause I know, I do know uh, as far as Japanese culture, because mm -hmm. the focus is so much on the collective we, and like, mm -hmm. you know, so if you're in, in a Japanese 
you're at work and you don't want to really want to go out for drinks afterwards, there's kind of this like pressure. You need to go out you for drinks, go whether out. you want to or not. Yeah. Right? You don't want to go go do karaoke. You have to go out and do karaoke. So yeah. is this kind of a response, almost like a um, sort of mini revolution that the, like the men are, are staging against against the sort of like collective we mm -hmm. uh, kind of um, uh, demands. I don't know. That's what I'm asking. I don't know. I I, I, I don't know it, it enough actually about it. To, no, I don't necessarily know. I think it's um, from what I know. I think it's just the fact that they don't believe in themselves anymore. They just don't see themselves as part of the community. Um, and I feel I can see a parallel with that yeah. with American culture. But I think instead of saying, "Oh, I'm not part of," the, I can't be part of a community. It's I'm not. I'm not. I'm not. Uh, you know the taking it like thinking about American exceptionalism and individualism, I'm not this individual that can give. You know, I'm not this very special mm -hmm. individual. Mm -hmm. And that can fuel it. So I see, you know, I see a parallel in the result and kind of the thinking, but like the... I almost think of it as like the failure to launch. Yeah, yeah. But like it, where, it, I guess where it stems from culturally is slightly different. Yeah. Um, yeah, I just, that's from what I, for me, that's just how I interpret it. Um, yeah. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I think when, when we put together yeah. these various factors, the idea is there could be, there's a lot of different ways that we are disconnected. And um, I think the concerning part is it's disproportionately younger people. And the reason that that's concerning is that this doesn't bode well for the future, that this could be more of the tip of the iceberg of what we're seeing. And uh, in terms of being like, you don't want to be alarmist, I don't want to be alarmist either, but I also would say that there's a reason I selected this topic or to, 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 to fit into this, um, that, that loneliness might be one of the primary factors that um, explains why politics is so nasty today and how it could get even worse. Yeah. Uh, and so I do think it is a fundamental problem, not just here, but potentially globally. Yeah, I actually, I, I, I definitely agree with that. And that, that's, that actually leads me to something else. Um, and this is more directed towards you, never to. Um, I, I, I'm sure you're aware in other countries that, the, you know, we see more here the social alienation and um, people becoming lonely has led to more extremism on the right. But in other countries, we've seen that also happen the other way around. We've seen that happen with the left, and we've seen it happen with just, you know, the whole spectrum, really. Um, again, I do not want to sound alarmist here. <laughs> it's just that. Um, with political polarization kind of coming up, I think I don't know if like, and we're seeing extremism more on the right, I don't know if that could happen on the left. But my question isn't if you can see it happening anytime. I don't, I'm, I don't want us to have a speculate. My question more is, as someone who's studying journalism and who wants to be involved in the media and who's a leftist himself, um, how can I present, inf like, do you have any recommendations on how can I present information in a way that can get people informed on issues from a certain perspective, but not make them feel, not create rage, not mm -hmm. be sensationalized, not be, not fuel them, not come off almost like propaganda? Mm -hmm. How, what can, what, what are some, like, like, was there any advice any of you guys have for um. how? how someone in the media can approach that. I, um, I, just uh, what, one on. thing that I would just say is that um, any time that someone feels like they're being attacked, their personal beliefs are being attacked, um, that is the, the first step to not listening. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so we know that when you're trying to get someone to change their mind, um, the worst approach is to focus on what you disagree on. Um, so trying to find points of agreement with people, um, trying to connect to people, uh, you know, things that everybody would agree on um, can be a, a good starting place. I, I'm not sure how effective it, it, that would be for journalism, but I'm just no, saying, no, I mean, you know, if you're trying to um, convey information in a way where people aren't getting defensive, mm -hmm. the first step is yeah. to try to, to create like an us. Yeah. with the other person because as soon as the other person sees you as them as one of those people mm -hmm. as a lib libtard um you know <laughs> yeah, they're exactly. they're not thinking so anymore awesome. they're yeah. not thinking with their prefrontal yeah. cortex or it's yeah. their amygdala and and they're not going to listen to what you have to say no matter how logical and rational it might be
Yeah. yeah um. So I just want to point out that we are just about out of time, and you asked a really, really thoughtful question. And I, I know that I can speak for myself that I'll stick around and talk to you yeah, about these uh, questions. I'll, I'll say just real quick that um, there's a Boston Globe article, Millions of Americans Believe Political Violence is Justified, and it cites 10 million people on the left who are willing to use uh, violence to achieve political means. So you're right, it is not just limited to the conservatives. There's also liberals who would engage in political violence. Um, in terms of journalism, I think that we have to be careful that there isn't always two sides to every story. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, there, there's sometimes there's just one side. Right. You know, political violence is not justified or you don't try to, you know, justified. overturn an election or, right. you know, have election lies. And as journalists, I think we have to, you know, cover uh, sometimes just the one side, that there's just the facts. Um, but um, the threats facing political systems because of this is very real, and I hope that journalism is treated as such. Mm -hmm. I want to thank all of you for being here today. <laughs> I appreciate the very thoughtful questions. Um, we are just a couple minutes over time, so if you could join me in thanking our panel members for being here today. Mm -hmm. Thank oh, you. All of them. Uh, and um, happy to take any individual questions for those who have them. Thank you. Like in the second episode of the newsroom, I've shown this before to my American government students. Like we talk about media, and like I don't think this is like in the liberal tribune, but the cover media, they talk about.